Brian Kramer here at Pure Matter. Um, I'm actually in Orlando. <laughs> so coming to you live um, here in Orlando and excited for another webinar with um, some very exciting stuff. I know no one likes ice cream, so um, that'll be, uh, you know, you guys will have to endure the rest of this. Um, and we're here, and it's exciting to be here. We're talking about creating authentic experiences with Jay Curley, Senior Global Marketing Manager at Ben & Jerry's. We um, had a chance, uh, Jay and I, to meet at um, an event at Pivot in New York. I think it was almost a year ago, um, just around there, and we were on stage together and had just a blast um, talking about that. He was had some great points, and after hearing and seeing some of the stuff that he was sharing, I knew we had to collaborate on something else, and he was nice enough to show back up for another Pure Matter um, substance here. So, uh, Jay, I think everyone can see you there on the video. Go ahead and wave and say hi, and we'll double check your sound and make sure everyone can hear you okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Brian and uh, Pure Matter, for inviting me. You got it. You got it. Well, um, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, the first thing I, I want to do, um, let's see, the first thing that I want to do is make sure that I do a proper introduction. Um, Jay, you have all kinds of experience. I mean, dating back to uh, being an account manager, an HR coordinator, and, and then on into marketing. You've worked on both the, I think, the agency side and, and the client side, and you've been an integrated marketing manager. And now you lead, I guess I understand, you lead the development and execution of consumer marketing activities in the United States and global strategy. Um, these integrated programs bring Ben & Jerry's progressive three-part mission to life in traditional advertising, innovative social media and digital engagements, retail shops, social activism, and live consumer experiences. Um, say all that ten times. That is a <laughs> lot to do. Well, I have a great team that, uh, that really... Uh, does a lot of the work, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But well, good. Good. Um, Why don't I um, just let everyone know real quick? We are having a live tweet chat. It's at hashtag PM Substance. You can reach Jay throughout this as well, and I'm sure he won't be tweeting while he's giving the presentation. But what he will be doing is um, tweeting following, and so you can reach him at Jay Cur Curley, J A Y C U R L E Y, or um, you can obviously CC Ben and Jerry's, and I'm at Brian Kramer. That's pretty easy. B R Y A N K R A M E R. Um, that said, uh, we will take questions throughout. Please go ahead and tweet, um, and I may ask a few during the course of the webinar, but definitely at the end, um, we'll have some time for Q and A. So, uh, with that said, Jay, you're on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. I just reiterate, thank you for. Uh, for the experience and, and for inviting me. Uh, I will say that I don't usually do webinars like this. I'm probably more uh, comfortable up on a stage in front of people than I am sitting at my desk staring at my webcam, but I will, uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to try to kind of tell you a little bit about our story and, and how we approach you know, marketing, if you will. I mean, for us, marketing is really about expressing ourselves as people. Uh, and connecting with people who have shared values and shared experiences. That to us is what, what marketing is. And that's how we have, uh, over the years, built the Ben & Jerry's brand uh, and you know, try our best to really kind of cultivate the fan base that we have uh, and, and deliver amazing experiences for them. You know, so that's ultimately what it's about for us is it's trying to kind of treat our fans, you know, the right way as if they are, truly are our friends because they are, uh, whether it's at an event, in a scoop shop that you walk into, uh, or in an online community, whatever it might be. So we try to create really authentic and outrageous experiences for people and we try to bring the full expression of our company to life to do that. Uh, so that's, you know, thinking about our fans themselves, the flavors we make, the values that uh, that the company stands for and believes in, and the fun that we have as a co company and a culture. Uh, so that's that's kind of the basic approach. In doing that, we really try our best to understand and embrace new communities as they uh, as they develop, and empower our fans 
uh, really to tell our story uh, through their own words and images and expressions. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about here. I'm going to talk about a little bit about who we are, what our approach is, uh, and then you know kind of give you some examples of how that actually comes to life. I'll start with one that I think is fun, <laughs> uh, which is uh, just a one-off tweet that we did at the beginning of this year. And you can kind of read it here. It was the day after uh, the state of Colorado uh, legalized marijuana for recreational use. Uh, so for us, Ben and Jerry's, we don't really think about kind of real-time marketing, if you will, uh, at least in the way that I see a lot of the industry doing it. You know, we could care less about the Super Bowl or the Oscars or moments like that. Um, but we are a group of real people that really do kind of, you know, want to engage and respond to things that our fans care about and things that connect with our values. Sometimes that's around supporting, you know, bigger issues like marriage equality, and sometimes it's just having a little bit of fun, uh, like when Colorado uh, uh, legalized marijuana. So we'll kind of start there, and, and now I'll kind of back out and, and tell you kind of how we're set up to be able to 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 A, understand what makes sense for us, uh, and, and B, actually execute it. So I have to start first, kind of back about 25 years. Our somewhat of a unique company, especially back in the 80s, uh, where we have a three-part mission. Uh, or excuse me, one aspect of that is a product to make the best ice cream in the world. One is the economic mission, which is to give a fair return to our shareholders. And we are a for-profit company, and, and we succeed in that. Uh, and the third piece, which is a very innovative piece, especially at the time, was really a social mission that's embedded in the way the company operates. So what we want to do is we want to use the power of the business itself um, to initiate uh, ways to improve the quality of life for people around the world, or really in all the communities we touch, which is now around the world. Uh, and if you're reading up at the top there, um, there's this concept that we call linked prosperity. What linked prosperity really means is that as the company succeeds, everyone that the company kind of, uh, kind of touches should succeed equally. So instead of looking at a supply chain and figuring out how are we going to extract as much value as possible, we look at a supply chain and figure out how can we put, use the business to put as much value back into those communities. So that starts with mainly where we get in our ingredients from, you know, uh, the dairy farms, here in Vermont. Um, we source uh, most of our commodities like cocoa and, and sugar and vanilla and coffee uh, through fair trade certified cooperatives. So it's really about giving back to those communities. Then we think about really where we live and work and how can we give back to communities like that. And then lastly, where we sell our products, which now is 30 plus countries. And that's where we, it's really interesting. When we look at a community like a city, uh, so you know, take Boston, LA, Stockholm, Sing uh, Singapore, whatever it might be. We w we want to understand what that community is so we can provide value. We do the same thing when we look at emerging social communities. Um, so when we look at Instagram, we think, you know, what is this community value? How can we, as Ben and Jerry's, you know, how are we uniquely positioned to provide value to that community? Uh, so we we apply that same business model approach of link prosperity to our approach to marketing. So what that really looks like, and this is right around the corner, right outside my office here. This is on our wall, and it's something we wrote out to really kind of uh, bring to life what our thinking is, how we approach marketing. And it's made up of a couple parts. The first is really creating outrageously authentic experiences. Um, but it's it's really it's through two things. It's really connecting with our fans and telling our unique story. So when we do those two things, um, connect with our fans and tell our story, uh, we're really able to kind of create those experiences. But it needs to happen with a foundation of the right people in place uh, and the right consideration of where we're connecting with people. Um, so that's kind of the 
way that we approach marketing. I, I think for us, it's a little bit different um, than a typical CPG uh, CPG company, because uh, we don't see ourselves that way. We see ourselves as a values-led business that has a unique lifestyle associated with it, and really that's where we start. Um, and so, therefore, our marketing, our PR, our design, our product innovation, all of that comes from a different place. Uh, and for us, it has to do with our point of view on the world and what our values are and the heritage, you know, really how we've gotten here. Um, so one of the things that we talk a lot about here at Ben & Jerry's is authenticity. You know, is what we're, the experiences we're creating, are they authentic to Ben & Jerry's? And so there's a couple different ways that we think, that, that we kind of evaluate whether an opportunity is, you know, authentic to us. Um, and that's certainly a buzzword that's kind of going around right now that is probably a little bit overused, uh, which all the more reason that we like to try to define it for ourselves, at least how, how we think about it. So starting with the context, does the context make sense for our company to be engaging with people around? You know, so a lot of that has to do with does it align with our, with our personality uh, and our values? And the other thing is, you know, is this something that any other brands could be doing? Um, because if the answer there is yes, then uh, it may not be right for us. Uh, we don't always live up to that bar, but that's the bar that we set. The next is, does this experience or give an opportunity for us to express ourselves the way we are? You know, is it give us an opportunity to talk about our tone, our look, our feel, who, who we are? Um, we've done some work. One of the challenges about being a kind of values-led lifestyle company versus a CPG brand um, is we stand for a lot of things. We're very at least at our best, we're very dynamic, we're, we're, we're a multi-layered company, and we're not just about the best ice cream in, in the world. Um, we like to think that we make that, but that's, you know, that's not the sum of our existence. And for us, we've really kind of laid out some different areas that we, that we operate in, and that's, those are the content pillars that help us kind of evaluate that. I'll share those in a little bit, but it really has to do with our flavors, our values, our, our the fun that we have as a culture and the community that we have as fans. And then the last piece is, is this context that we're going to kind of create this experience in, is it something that, that people care about? Is there an opportunity that you know, people would want to share it? That is there an opportunity for it to be amplified? So that's you know, the, the quick approach on how we approach uh, authenticity at Ben & Jerry's, the right context fitting our brand tone, look and feel, the content pillars, and lastly, an opportunity for it to be uh, become amplified. So that's a little bit about who we are. You know, I didn't get too deep into we're an ice cream company. Um, I think most folks uh, are aware of, of our ice cream out there, and if not, I'm happy to kind of take those questions after. But now I want to go through, kind of remember that period, pyramid, excuse me, you know, the, the top there about the authentic experiences, what I just shared is how we evaluate that. Now is the kind of the two aspects of how we bring it to life, connecting with people and telling our story. So the first example I'll share is one where we really thought about a community and tried to connect with people that way. So Ben & Jerry's joined, um, joined Instagram in, I think it was early 2011, if I have my timing right. And like a lot of ways, it, it happened organically. A few of the folks here had joined and were using it and um, really realized, okay, this is an opportunity for us to connect with people, an opportunity for us to tell our story. And so we started sharing photos and what we realized quickly was that people love sharing their photos with us. And after, you know, a couple years on the, on the as members of the community, we realize we need to do something to thank this community. And so that's where the kind of link prosperity approach comes in. We thought about what does this community really value and how, how can we as Ben & Jerry's uniquely you know, you know, bring that value to the community. 
So at least at the time, and I think this was fall of 2012, if I have my timing right, um, we, we, we devised a program that did two things for people. Uh, it recognized amazing photography, which is something that you know, was very important to the community. And it gave people an opportunity to be recognized for their, for their uh, photography. So what we did is we created a, a campaign called Capture Euphoria. And what we asked is we asked all of our fans to, to ultimately sh basically share their euphoric moments with us. And these moments weren't all about ice cream. It was really whatever kind of euphoria meant to the individual uh, members of the community. And what we did was we created one-off advertisements in their local communities that featured their username and their photo and really thanked them for kind of sharing the experience. Um, we did this for, in a, for about 40 people in eight different countries around the world. And you can kind of see just quickly uh, the, the types of photos that we shared. Uh, they were, or that, that we chose, they were really uniquely euphoric moments for these people. I think maybe two or three of them have ice cream in them. But that wasn't really the point. The idea was around, you know, what people felt was was authentic to them, and and we then had the opportunity to to kind of give back to them and to the community at large. So we did, you know, billboards all over the world. We did, you know, old-fashioned newspaper ads. Um, in I think it was Chattanooga, Tennessee, we were looking for media opportunities. And we couldn't find anything great, but we realized that the photographer spent a lot of time in a few couple a couple different bars. And so we, we had special coasters made. Um, actually, I realize there's a webcam I can maybe show you. So in all the bars uh, in Chattanooga, there were these special uh, coasters made for at Gina420. Nice handle, too. So um, that, that's an example of really thinking about the community uh, and developing a program you know, around them. That's really about them. And yes, it's very much hosted and brought to you by Ben and Jerry's, uh, but it's not an ice cream thing. Another thing that kind of is about, I guess, listening to our fans and understanding our community is an opportunity that we realized existed uh, and we, we capitalized on it a couple of years ago or, or really is that on Valentine's Day, there's a lot of people out there who um, spend their night with just two guys, Ben and Jerry, <laughs> and they really like to talk about that. They really like to um, to kind of share the experience that, hey, I'm home alone, but it's uh, I'm here with my two best friends or my dates, Ben and Jerry. And so, we um, in 2013, what we did is we decided, all right, there's literally thousands of people out there that are talking to us on this day, and they're kind of lonely, why don't we connect with every single one of them through Twitter? And so what we did the first year is we created one-off Valentine cards for pretty much everyone who mentioned Ben and Jerry's on Valentine's Day. And they were created uniquely for each person in each experience. And kind of see the, the, the photo uh, up there is it was just about 10 of our employees who sat in a room for about 12 hours. Um, our husbands and wives and girlfriends and boyfriends weren't too excited about that, but, <laughs> but they understand. Uh, and then this year we actually took it a step further and we delivered about 60 ice cream cakes to individuals uh, in, in four cities in San Francisco, New York, Boston, and London. Uh, so we, we kind of broke that barrier and it wasn't just a personalized tweet, it was an actual cake delivery for about 60 people. So again, a really great way for us to listen to our community and connect with people uh, when they're thinking about us. Um, and lastly is you know, really something that this company has been built on, which is good old fashioned sampling. Um, back in the 80s, Ben and Jerry did not have big ad budgets to be you know, doing television commercials and that kind of stuff. The way the company has built our brand is by getting people to try our ice cream. Because at least we think it is really delicious and a step above most other ice cream that's out there. It's rich, it's dense, there's really unique flavors in terms of the, the 
the chunks and the swirls and the flavor combinations. So we need to get people to try it. And once they get that, once they try it, they become fans. So for the last, you know, the first 30 years of our history, that was a big part of our approach. Um, and it was a great experience. Uh, but it was really a very much a one-on-one -on -one experience. It was about us giving someone a sample, them enjoying it, and, and that was great. And we still do that, a ton of that. But it was hard to really scale that, to get more and more people excited, excuse me, about the company uh, as we're sampling. And I think it was back in 2009, we took a very traditional sampling tour and we evolved it. And so even at, even at that point, we had been using social media to tell people, hey, we're, we're at you know Bryant Park or Union Square or X grocery store. Come down and get a sample. And that works. We got a few more people out. But it still didn't scale um, and wasn't that special for people. What we did back in 2009 and we now do in about 20 countries around the world is we flipped the model. We asked our fans via Twitter, all right, we have an ice cream truck to fill up ice cream. Where do you want us to go? And then based on people's responses via Twitter, that's actually where we go. Uh, and so this, this program is being run right now. So for the US audience, we're in DC, and we're in uh, Orange County. We're heading to Portland, Oregon next, and New York next. You can tweet us at Ben Jerry's Truck on the East Coast and at Ben Jerry's West on the West Coast. Um, but it's a great way for us to de deliver that experience for people in a, in a more, really a, even more individual experience, but one that is it's shared by way more people. Um, so that's a lot of the examples about kind of connecting with people. The other kind of pillar is about telling our own story, about our point of view, about our heritage. Uh, and I will, uh, I'll be honest in the sense that I, I feel lucky and blessed uh, to be charged with telling the Ben and Jerry story because it is a truly unique story and we have a real clear understanding of who we are and what our point of view is. And so that is very liberating. Um, it, it sets a high bar for us, but it's a, it's a really great way for us to be able to um, uh, express ourselves. So what we start with uh, are the basics. It's either the story we're trying to tell or the information we're trying to convey. Uh, sometimes those stories can be complex, like you know what fair trade certification of a coffee bean really means and how it contributes to cooperatives, economic development, fair wage labor practices, and sustainability. See, I'm already starting to lose some of you guys. <laughs> um, so it can be complex uh, uh, stories like that. It can be basic information, like what are the ingredients in Cherry Garcia, and what is this closest scoop shop to me? So you know, we start with those stories and information. And from there, we build content for the online and digital world. And we build experiences for the real real life world, whether that's sitting on your couch or the truck showing up to you or you coming into one of our scoop shops. Um, so that's kind of the model of how we think about it. I think probably it's, it's fairly straightforward and, and not uh, not a revelation to anyone. But it's starting with those the stories and information, it's building content and experiences around that, and then really thinking about the connection points. Uh, so just a real timely example of how we bring that to life. Uh, in April in Australia, uh, you know, Ben and Jerry's, we have a uh, we have a deep rooted belief that in this in the in, in a future that is more sustainable, and we're not heading down the right path as a society right now. And there's lots of things that we can do as a company, and that you know, as communities, we can do together. And that we see that as our role. It, it, to, to let our fans know what some of these issues are and give them an opportunity to, to, to be a part of movements. So in Australia, um, they're, they're basically we're looking to dig up, dredge out uh, coral reefs in order to, uh, to build new shipping lanes, um, mainly to be used to export coal out of Australia. And so for a number of reasons, this does not line up to our vision of a more sustainable future. So we worked with the World Wildlife uh, Foundation uh, to 
to create a you know fight for the reef campaign, and um, you know we 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 did just that. We built content to tell people what the issue was through social. We got you know got in a scoop truck, drove around to all the communities, gave out ice cream, and told people what the issue was. Um, and in kind of by telling those stories about this is this is what we believe in, this is how you can get involved. We're able to tell people more about who we are. You know, in this particular case, the um, the, min the local government minister actually called for a boycott of, of Ben and Jerry's, um, but ultimately that got more and more people to to understand what was happening and drew even more uh, attention to the issue. So for us, that was uh, that was a win because we were able to really uh, create more attention. Um, this was not our goal at all, but if you can see from this poll from a local newspaper. Um, the end result is people are more likely to, to buy Ben and Jerry's uh, as a result. Again, that's not our goal, but it's a great uh, unintended consequence. You know, a similar example uh, is our stance on marriage equality, and I am so overjoyed by the fact that so many more brands are are part of this movement now and really helping to mainstream it. Uh, Back in the late 80s, Ben & Jerry's was one of the first companies in the U.S. to uh, extend benefits to same-sex partners. Uh, and it really it just goes back to our deep-rooted belief in social justice. This is an equality issue for us. Um, but again, we have an opportunity to kind of tell our story about how we feel about social justice, get more people involved in the movement itself, and you know, use the power that we have and the, and the voice that we have to get more people excited. So back in 2009, when the state of Vermont uh, legalized uh, same-sex marriage, we symbolically renamed Chubby Hubby to Hubby Hubby, uh, and you know, create a lot of excitement, helped to really celebrate the uh, the huge milestone that that created the first state in the U.S. to um, through a state legislature legalize full marriage uh, for same-sex couples. Uh, and since then, we've done similar programs around the world, uh, including in Australia, the Say I Do campaign, uh, a campaign in Italy, one in Ireland, and one in um, in the UK. And it's it's really hey, just again a great way for yep. Hey, Jay, um, I, you may you may get into this, but we had a question from Tanya who asked what kind of response you've had from this campaign. Yep, that's a that's a great question. Um, so when we first did the Hubby Hubby campaign in 2009, I would say that the majority of the response of negativity and hate pointed our way as well. We were boycotted by a number of, of groups that didn't believe in our, in our approach uh, to, to justice and marriage equality for all. Um, that's fine with us. Not everyone has to love Ben and Jerry's, uh, and especially when it comes to our values. Uh, we believe what we believe, not because it's in vogue and not because of some um, focus group, but because those are the core values that this company has has been built on. Um, and so to this day, uh, I think we, we continue to support marriage equality here in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, and we're often met with resistance and met with, uh, and to be honest, a lot of hate. Uh, and I think it's unfortunate, but it, it tells us that you know we, we do have a, a point of view kind of rooted in our values, and we're not going to back back away from that. So I don't. Know, hopefully that answers the question. That's great. That's great. Um, so those are, those are some of the stories, if you will, uh, about how we tell our story. Um, in order to, to try to live up to this approach that, we, that we've mapped out, um, you know, we, we need to have and we need to be able to operationalize it. And for us, that has to do with the right people in place, uh, the right processes so we can um, you know, be somewhat consistent and, uh, and share these practices around the world and a real understanding for 
um, the touch points that make the most sense for us. So I'll kind of take you guys through this quickly. Uh, first is the people themselves. Uh, so this is a, just a part of, actually, a lot, a lot of these guys are on my team. A lot of them are just the extended group here at Ben and & Jerry's, and they're just a, a portion of it. But this is how we do um, community management at Ben & Jerry's. It's a large group of people. Uh, none of these people's full-time job is community management, um, but all of them are involved in it. And through that kind of collective, we're, we're able to kind of stay involved and we're, we're able to manage the communities without having to either outsource it or have it just be drilled down into one person who is the only one kind of uh, connecting with people. And so, you know, you can kind of just see quickly, we have different people working in different communities. Uh, two of the folks up here are based just outside of London and are managing a lot of our European community. Uh, but that's, that's really the approach. And we do, while we definitely work with, with outside agencies, uh, to help us in, in various ways. The vast majority of community management, content development is all done in-house um, by our teams. Uh, so those, those are some of the people. And I, you know, just kind of looking at the photos quickly, a lot of these, these folks have been working at Ben & Jerry's for you know, 5, 10, 15 plus years. Uh, we're, for better or for worse, we're the kind of company that when you come here, you really join the community and you become kind of members of the family. And uh, and so there's a there's a lot of institutional knowledge, if you will, just kind of inherent in the in the group you're seeing here. The next piece is the the process, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just to say that we really consider how we sound, what we look like, and what we talk about. And so to do that, we've really mapped out what our tone is, what our photo style is, uh, and the areas uh, that, we, that we focus on. You know, our fans, the fun we have as a culture, our flavors, and our values. Those are really what we, what we really try to talk about uh, you know, as we're developing experiences, as we're developing content. And then the last piece is, you know, again, I feel fortunate because Ben & Jerry's in a lot of ways was a social brand before social media existed. We were built, you know, through Ben & Jerry getting in a truck and driving around and giving people samples. We were built through PR, through word of mouth, uh, not through, you know, kind of above the line TV commercials and that kind of stuff. And we may dabble in some of that here and there these days, but for the most part, we operate in our scoop shops or in pop culture or at events in your newsfeed, um, or you know, actually on on the packaging, it's a great way for us to tell our story as well. Um, so that's really what we think about when we're thinking about um, how we're connecting with people in the places in which we want to do that. Uh, so that is pretty much what I have to share. Um, so I think I, uh, yeah, I think I left plenty of time for for questions and whatnot. Um, so I. We'll, uh, I'll kind of leave it with that. Again, if you kind of, I'll, I'll jump back out to, to the little pyramid I, I created here, uh, recreated here, I should say. Um, but that's really how we, the structure that we're thinking about. Jay, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And the questions yep. are rolling in. <laughs> so I will, uh, I'm going to attempt to get through them here. Um, I think we have enough time. Um, so let's get let's get going. Let me start with one here. This one is from Stephanie. Um, interesting how Ben and Jerry's doesn't have a dedicated community manager, but a collective. Would love to learn more about how you do this. How do you mm -hmm. organize that? So we we have people that are running point on each community. Um, so you know. The, Facebook in the U.S. It's actually, you know, two people doing community management, uh, and then two other people really thinking about content development and creating that kind of stuff. And that's uh, probably our biggest community. Uh, we basically have a, I think collective is a great way to put it, uh, of about eight or so people based here, and a few people are in charge of strategy, a few people are in charge 
stage of content development and then other people are handling community management. We all get together. It sounds very basic and very simple. We have an hour-long meeting once a week where we all talk about what's happening in each community. Uh, and, th and that's not just the digital and the social teams. The, the entire kind of organization is represented. The scoop shops, the social mission, uh, consumer affairs, PR, we're all kind of connected in that meeting uh, to really talk about what's happening in, in different spaces. Again, uh, what, what were you know, priorities in terms of communication for us. Uh, and that model, I think, you know, helps us to, first of all, spread around the organization uh, what matters or what it's like to really uh, be connected to the people in all the different communities. Uh, and it also, you know, alleviates the pressure of responding to every single post from one person, which after a while, uh, I'm sure there's community managers out there listening, you know, that can be, can lose its luster after a while. So. Great. Um, and we all, you should name an ice cream after losing your luster. I, do you ever <laughs> just feel like every time you say something, that could be the name of an ice cream? And that's a question. Um, kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you think in ice cream names or in hashtag? <laughs> Sadly enough, me personally, it's probably more hashtags than uh, ice cream <laughs> names. But um, but no, I, you know what is fun is in a similar way. Okay, like the names of our ice creams are created in very similar ways, where we're taking suggestions from fans, where we have kind of brainstorms, where everyone from the IT guy to the finance guy to the brand team to the flavor developers are all kind of sitting uh, and just throwing out ideas. Uh, and sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't. But you know, it's fun. <laughs> I want to be on that team. <laughs> um, we have a question here from Brian Waxman. He asked, um, or he, actually first he said that uh, Ben and Jerry's has been very successful on Instagram, as you pointed out in your presentation. What factors led you to be an early adopter of promoted posts? Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I mean, I think overall, some of the success we've had in Instagram, uh, again, came from early understanding of what the community valued. Uh, I, no one's probably going to do this, but if you went through our, you know, thousand plus photos that we've posted, you'll see the beginning. The photos at the beginning weren't that great. They were mostly me <laughs> taking bad photos with my iPhone, and uh, most of the credit goes to Mike Hayes, who's, who's on our team, who realized, you know. People really value good photography here, and he started to, to, you know, play around with that and take some great photos, and it, we started to have a lot of success. So as the community grew and grew, uh, and we ran programs like Capture Euphoria that I talked about, uh, the opportunity came to kind of be in that first beta group um, with promoted posts, and I think for us, uh, two things. Uh, it was. I mean, it's a great community that we wanted to be a part of, and from a business perspective, we saw it as a good opportunity to kind of get our, our, uh, our content in front of more people. Um, I also think that we felt a responsibility to the community uh, to, and I don't know if we lived up to this, but, uh, but to kind of use the understanding and the experience that we had in the community to hopefully create some really good content that people would enjoy and wouldn't feel like it was... Uh, you know, they were getting bombarded by ads. And, you know, I, I know that I'm sure there's plenty of people who did feel like they were going to get bombarded by ads and, and still felt that way. But I, I do know, we know that a lot of people really enjoyed them. So I think overall it was a really good experience for us. And who doesn't like seeing ice cream in an ad next to other ads that have nothing to do with what you do like? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which is something that I think everyone is having a problem with, especially on Facebook. And hopefully, you know, as we both know, they're you're trying to make it um, a little more customized, personalized. But there's a lot of people mm -hmm. out there that are targeting ads to people that have nothing to do with the product. You know, I there's no way I'm gonna buy, um, you know, ladies hosiery for myself. Um, right. or something you know, like that, and yet it's targeted yeah. to me, and I'm like, who did this? How did this get yeah, in I my think that, brain? Now, ice cream I, I think it, it's a real challenge across the board. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a real challenge, I think, for marketers in general. I think as we think we know more and more about our audience based on, on inputs that we're getting. Uh, you know, a perfect example for me is um, I don't have cable, so I've been watching uh, the World Cup on Univision uh, on my iPad, and now I'm getting a lot of sponsored uh, stories and sponsored tweets in Spanish, and I do not speak Spanish. Uh, so, you know, someone there is taking one data point about usage and thinking that I'm someone that I'm not. Uh, and I think that's a real challenge for marketers. I, I'm sure that as Ben and Jerry's, we kind of, you know, I'm sure we make mistakes mm -hmm. like that uh, sometimes as well. Um, but I, I think the good news is overall, we do know more about our audience, and therefore we can be delivering, you know, value to them in their newsfeed. You know, so it's yeah. I, I, everyone's heard kind of stories like this, but it really is about providing value to people and not. Uh, just getting in their way and interrupting them. Right. Well, we have a question here from Daniel Green. He said, how far out do you build a content calendar and how flexible is it? Uh, we build it at the top level annually. We go down a level quarterly. We go down another level monthly. We go down another level weekly. Uh, and then it's very flexible from there. <laughs> uh, is, is the short short answer. Uh, you know, we really think about, um, you know, what aspects of our story do we want to be telling this year? What are just general kind of jobs to be done as a brand? What do we need to be communicating about new stories? Um, and then on a global level, we do quarterly uh, content development. On a country level, we do it monthly. And then, like I said, we have that kind of weekly meeting where we connect with people. Uh, and there's a lot of flexibility when things come up in that in that manner. And I think that's because a lot of the community management and content development that we're doing uh, is done in-house. So it's sometimes like that. The Colorado tweet I, I shared at the beginning was developed in about an hour. Uh, and it was just kind of the team saying, oh, here's an opportunity, and just getting it done. Well, that's great. Um, so I. I guess I have a question just before I ask this question from uh, Joey Lopez. Um, you guys obviously are a collaborative um, atmosphere. You're taking a very collaborative approach, which is fantastic. It's part of what we're, you know, um, all about it as well. Um, but I'm curious, how do you collab? What do you use to collaborate? Is it good old-fashioned, you know, email and text or <laughs> Mm -hmm. How do you, is yeah. there a collaborative system that you're using so that you a can actually of... pull ideas faster? Yeah, uh, no, and if anyone has any good ideas for what those are, let me know. Um, no, we, we do it the old-fashioned way for the most part, where we're, um, where we have a, a core team here that is walking over to each other's desks and talking about ideas. Uh, we have a couple agency partners that we definitely rely on and um, and connect with, but it's you know it's more that kind of for better or for worse typical relationship where it's you know weekly calls and emails coming back and forth, uh, and the similar relationship that we have with our international teams where we're, we are uh, you know we have our, our check ins and we have our emails that we bounce around you know I think we're our my inbox probably looks as bad if not worse as, than most people's so. <laughs> So Joey Lopez, he asked, um, uh, Ben and Jerry ta has tackled same-sex marriage and saving the reef. What's next on the radar? Yep, that's a wonderful question. Um, well, two things. One is same-sex marriage and saving the environment are still on the radar. They don't go away. Uh, but right now our, our, in the U.S., we have a really big effort going towards trying to uh, get GMO labeling passed uh, nationwide. Uh, and, and Vermont was actually the first state to pass a law that um, requires GMOs to be labeled in, in foods. And um, uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, we were sued by a bunch of food manufacturers, uh, associations, organizations. And so we actually are working to help uh, the state of Vermont promote a fund that they've set up to actually help defend them against the lawsuit. Uh, so it was actually last week. Jerry Greenfield, one of our co-founders, and Governor Shumlin of Vermont met at our uh, 
at our Burlington Scoop Shop, and we un unveiled a uh, ceremonial or honorary renaming of Chocolate Fudge Brownie to Food Fight Fudge Brownie. Mm. Uh, so right now we're we're really focused on trying to get GMOs labeled in the U.S. And for us, it's really an issue about transparency. Um, we're we're not sure if GMOs are right for the future, right for us or not. Uh, we're not saying that we are, but we we do think that people have a right to know what's in their food. Uh, so that's a that's a big for most developed countries already require GMO labeling. Um, uh, but I think really what's next and we're is kind of coming back to an issue that's been a core, a core of who we are and, and what we've been trying to, to, to accomplish as a business, but is really to combat climate change and really, you know, I think the, the world has woken up to the, the issue, but we need real solutions, global solutions, and I think that we're going to put a lot of focus towards that in the future. Um, we had a big campaign back in 2002 and 2003 with the Dave Matthews Band we called Lick Global Warming. Um, so it's time for us to uh, to kind of actively re-engage in that uh, in that issue. Um, okay, so I got uh, some really great questions coming in here. You're 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 you've got some active people. <laughs> so great great uh, conversation here going on. Um, tell us, this is from Courtney um, Smith. Tell us about a situation when you launched a flavor. That didn't catch on so well. How did uh, Ben and Jerry's handle it and move forward? Um, we there's plenty of times I think that we don't a live up to our own kind of model that we've put out. Uh, plenty of times, and there's also plenty of times where we think we've done everything right and we haven't. Uh, you know, I'm not. I don't have a great specific example. Uh, but I will say that you know, as we launch a new flavor or a new product, not all of them succeed. Certainly not all of them succeed. If anyone's ever been to our factory in in Waterbury, you've gone to our. We actually have a graveyard. It's called the Flavor Graveyard. It's an actual graveyard where when flavors get discontinued, they get buried. They get a tombstone. Um, but that's a way for us to, in essence, celebrate our our failures, um, of which we have plenty. Uh, but you know, I think for us, when, when we evaluate why something didn't succeed, we, we you know we, we look at was it the right was it the wrong flavor was it the wrong time uh, or did we launch it the wrong way? Uh, and I think we, we try to evaluate all those different uh, aspects and um, you know try to learn from those experiences and, and move forward. I think just like any organization that uh, that kind of that values, if you will, um, their failures as an opportunity. Great. All right, this next one's from uh, Ryan Campbell. What's the most exciting trend for Ben and Jerry's in social that you see right now? That is a great question. Um, you know, I think I don't have a I don't have a bullseye. Qu uh, uh, answer for it. I think when I look around, um, I'm mostly trying to focus on, and you know, there are all sorts of emerging platforms and platforms that have been around for a while that are growing, and we don't operate in all of them. But we do look at each one and we, we try to evaluate. Does it make sense for us to move into Snapchat? Uh, we haven't yet because we haven't been able to really figure out how can we bring unique value to that space. I think once we do, we would potentially go there. Um, I think for brands, the biggest challenge is, OK, and this is, this is not different than it was a couple years ago, but it changes slightly every year. It's still about. How are you going to break through? How are you going to um, have your story be relevant to the right people? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's what we're uh, working on every day, if you will, and um, and I I still see that as the, the the big question for brands, you know. So 
okay, the, the algorithm got turned down on us on Facebook, how are we going to respond to that? All right, you know, and I think I know that there'll be a ton of changes like that over the next six months, over the next six years. So fundamentally, it comes back to the overarching question about how are we going to make our story relevant to people? Right. Um, yeah. Great. Great. Um, let's see here. The, there was another question that just came in. That was a two-part question from Rachel Allen. Um, the do you have certain compliance regulations you have to follow at Ben and Jerry's, and uh, and how do you measure analytics? Two very big questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we have we operate under kind of the same you know macro rules that any company does in terms of compliance and regulation, uh, and we you know have when we're going into areas that we know are are sticky. Um, and a lot of our social mission uh, is is that space. Uh, then we, you know, we we really work with our legal and communication teams to make sure that what we're talking about uh, makes sense for us, and you know, we're not taking unnecessary risk. So we, we kind of go through a similar process like everyone else there. Mm -hmm. um, as far as analytics go, you know, we we look at numbers globally on a monthly basis and on a quarterly basis. And you know, we're, we're looking at a lot of the same measures that other people are, the quantitative measures around reach and engagement. Uh, and qualitatively, we're not so much you know, reading sediment and that kind of stuff, but we are trying to understand what's landing, what's working, what isn't. So it's a combination of both the, you know, the hard numbers and kind of the, the context that they're happening in. <laughs> You probably heard that in the background. Somebody wants me to uh, ask the um, an SNL question here on uh, Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. um, let me pull that up. This is a personal request from one of our people here. Um, what is the story behind the new SNL flavor ice cream? Mm -hmm. So that one was really fun. Um, it's we're we're coming up, this September will be the 40th anniversary of Saturday Night Live, uh, and we have a good relationship with, with them in general. We've, we've had a lot of partnerships with SNL alum over the years, uh, and so it just it seemed like a really great opportunity for us to help them celebrate this big milestone, uh, uh, and again, do it in a way that's, we, we think, a lot of fun, uh, which for us has to do with creating a series of flavors that really pay homage to some really fun SNL sketches. So I think I think what's really special about these flavors um, is that you have to go into a Ben & Jerry's scoop shop to get them. You know, they, these aren't going to be in every grocery store uh, and every corner store the way a lot of our flavors are. So it's really about kind of getting into one of the stores. Um, so we just last week launched the first two uh, in what will be a series of flavors. Um, and you know, just I think two really fun flavors, delicious flavors as well. But, but you know, I think kind of going back to is this an authentic space for Ben and Jerry's? Uh, I think we're lucky in the sense that we one thing that we think is authentic to us and has been a part of our culture since day one has been just having fun. Uh, you know, the very first free cone day that we had back in 1979. Ben and Jerry created some posters to, to promote Free Cone Day, and they put a quote from each of them on the uh, on the poster. And the quote from Jerry was, "If it's not fun, why do it?" And I think if you're looking for an overarching strategy around why we created SNL flavors, <laughs> I think if it's not fun, why do it? Uh, what is the strategy? But, uh, I love that. That's you know um, what our uh, mantra at Pure Matter is: serious fun. So. Um, you know, to Perfect. to actually uh, hear that there's other companies out there um, operating with that as as part of their mantra or mission is is right in line with what we're we're believing. Um, what um one of the questions here that we had um, from Tracy Blackman is how has your background in HR helped to make you a better marketer? Uh, wow, that's a question I wasn't expecting. Um. Well, Tracy I'll take you guys way back. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one, Tracy. Um, so 
Uh, this is probably a little more personal history about Jay Curley than anyone wanted. Um, but you want me to mute just so it's between the <laughs> two of us? So. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I started my I started my undergrad um, as a psychology major and really thinking that I was going to, you know, go on to be a psychologist. You know, how does, how does that make you feel and go help people in that way? And uh, towards my end of my undergrad, I took a management and organizational behavior course that was kind of a blend of business theory and uh, organizational development from a psychology perspective. And I just fell in love with it. I absolutely loved it. And I, it was my first kind of exposure to, to business in that way. Uh, and so I, that summer, summer between my junior and senior year, I did an internship in HR at Burton Snowboards. And it was a great experience. And that's really what I decided I wanted to do with my life was get into HR and help, help business by helping people. Uh, and I did that for a couple years at an agency, uh, JDK Design, here in Burlington, Vermont. And I, I did that, and it was, it was great, but I kind of hit a ceiling, and I had to decide, was I going to stay at JDK, which is a place that I absolutely loved, or was I going to move um, on elsewhere in HR? And I was offered an account management role at JDK that was kind of moved into more marketing and, and strategy around design. And I, and, I, and I stayed, and I did that. I think, and you know, kind of has has led me to where I am now. But the foundation around kind of understanding people and uh, having uh, trying my best to be empathetic uh, has, I think, helped me as as a, a marketer. Uh, again, really to just try to understand people to make sure I'm providing value for them. Um, and being at a company like Ben and Jerry's aligns well with my personal values, so I'm able to kind of, you know. I would, um, let's see, I would imagine that they also don't, uh, never saw you coming when uh, a marketer is asking them all kinds of details on that health plan. Um, so <laughs> it that actually did happen. <laughs> <laughs> see? <laughs> yeah. That's, they're kind of screwed, but hey, that's part of the deal. So um, final yeah. question, and yeah. then we gotta, we got to let you go because we're at the top of the hour. Um, this is from April Parcher. How has the Internet of Things, um, I'm sure you've heard of the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything at this point, the physical to digital world, influenced your brand, or how do you see it influencing Ben & Jerry's in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I think... The, the short answer, if I look back over the last couple years, the Internet of Things per se hasn't, but really trying to blend online and offline experiences is core to what we try to do. And some of the examples I shared earlier, Capture the Euphoria, Valentine's Day with the cake delivery, the you know, tweet and we'll actually bring you ice cream. I think all of those are examples of how we really try to do that. Moving forward, as I look forward, um, you know, there's in the very short term, Next year or so, I don't see major disruptions to our business. If I look out over a decade, and you know things like uh, grocery delivery, uh, smart refrigerators and freezers, when those have really you know hit a point where, and I do believe they will, um, where they're very mainstream, that is definitely going to change the way we connect with people and the way that we tell our story, um, because it's going to probably change the way we sell our ice cream. That's great. Well, you know, I know that you're not a uh, fortune teller, and neither am I. So there's there's probably a lot as well that that's to come that, you know, is going to be invented. That you know, we're, as marketers, we're always, uh, you know, excited to hear what's actually happening. We're we're not the uh, the inventors of it. So um, that's a tough right. question to answer. But but thanks yeah. for thanks for um, for doing that. Um, one of the um, one of the things I wanted to make sure is just you know just to thank you for your time. Yeah, this has been excellent, and I know that the questions were rolling here. So, um, you know, obviously, uh, you're you're working for a good place with a with a with a fun uh, attitude, and um, you know, just excited to have the hour with you. So, thank you on behalf of everybody that's been watching. Thank you, and and for everyone who's been tweeting and, and listening, thank you for your time. Um, I I really appreciate it. I'll definitely try to get to, I'd say, all the, the questions on Twitter over the next 24 hours. So. 
Um, Great. Yeah, and, and thank you, Brian, and the Pure Matter team for, for inviting me to be a part of this. It's been fun. You got it, man. You got it. We'll talk soon. And to everyone out there, thank you so much. And again, this is going to be, this was recorded. It's going to be um, uh, sent out within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, and we will announce our next webinar, uh, which is, runs on a monthly basis right now. We'll, we'll send that out uh, very soon, letting you know who that is. But for now, thank you, Jay, and thank you, everyone out there, for um, uh, joining us here today. And we will see you soon.